Ayn Rand is loved, hated, admired, and despised all throughout the world. She created a philosophy that she called objectivism. But is objectivism a real philosophy? Should we take it seriously? How does it answer basic questions in metaphysics and epistemology? To help me learn, I've asked the founder of the Atlas Society, Dr. David Kelly, to come on the 61st episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Got another excellent and exciting episode for you today. I've gotten tons of requests from people to talk about Ayn Rand and objectivism, and I've yet to do so so far on my show. For about the past year, actually, I've been working on a four-part series called Why I'm Not an Objectivist. I haven't released any of the articles yet. I'm no expert on the philosophy, but from what I read, I've got some disagreements, some foundational disagreements. But several people whom I respect have in conversation mentioned or shared this YouTube lecture series on objectivism put on by a guy named David Kelly. This lecture series is very in-depth about objectivist philosophy in a way that I have never heard it presented. I was very impressed with what I heard, though I disagreed with some of the ideas, and thought, this is the guy I gotta have on the show to get down to some of the nitty-gritty philosophic details about objectivism. Let's see what's there. And sure enough, we had an excellent conversation. But before we dive into it, I want to tell you about the sponsor of this episode. If you are one of the many individuals that has started to doubt the value of the university degree, First of all, no, you're not alone. There are many other individuals, companies, and businesses which also see what you see. And now, Praxis is a company that's offering an alternative. Instead of the overpriced pseudo-education that you get at your average university system, the Praxis program is three months of a professional boot camp that is followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship in the real world. Graduates of the Praxis program now have a 98% employment rate with an average salary of $50,000. So if you're looking for an alternative, check out steve-patterson.com slash Praxis. My guest, Dr. David Kelly, is a philosopher and author of many books, including Unrugged Individualism, The Contested Legacy of Ayn Rand, The Evidence of the Senses, The Art of Reasoning, and A Life of One's Own. He is the founder of the Atlas Society, and he has been a proponent of objectivism for more than 25 years. I'll have a link to his website, his books, the YouTube lecture series I was talking about, all on the show notes page this week, which is steve-patterson.com slash 61. Enjoy. All right, Dr. David Kelly, thanks so much for coming on Patterson in Pursuit. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. So I have encountered lots of objectivists in my discussions and my travels, and almost universally, whenever I get down into the nitty-gritty of objectivist epistemology, people will send me links or they'll say, hey, you got to listen to these lectures that were put on by David Kelly back in, I think it was the late 80s. They're out on YouTube, and they're fantastic, I must say. They're definitely the most in-depth objectivist material that I've read anywhere, Um, and I know lots of people really love it. Well, thank you. Uh, Those were lectures that I gave at colleges in the, I think they were mostly in the um, 80s, as you say, and um, I've always been amazed that, I mean, they're fairly technical. They were um, uh, written for and delivered for people who had, you know, a very high degree of interest in um, objectivism and you know a high degree of knowledge about it. So, but the the fact that uh, I mean, they're not they're not listening to a philosophy lecture instead of being able to read it and stop and and think is is a challenge. So I I really <laughs> am, am grateful for the interest. I'm I have uh, begun writing up some of them and uh, will continue to do so. That's great, and I I do want to cover some of the material that you'll have covered in those lectures. I'll make sure to have. Um, the the videos I'm talking about linked in the show notes for this week. But I want to start with you kind of at the basics, and then we'll get into more advanced stuff. I think the basics, if you got to start anywhere with Ayn Rand, 
it's the fact that so many philosophers, professional philosophers and public intellectuals, don't even consider Ayn Rand a philosopher to be begin with. They don't even think that she meets the basic criteria for being taken seriously as a philosopher. Now you, I'm guessing, have some disagreement with that position. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good guess, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have a uh, complete disagreement with that. And I will say that your perception of the academic world, the world of academic philosophers, is basically correct and has been from the beginning. But over the years, there have been um, thinkers, uh, people in technical ap academic philosophy, who have found great value in Rand's mm. ideas. It's a small minority. But um, it, it, in addition to myself, Self, there are others who are writing at what we would consider um, a professional philosopher philosophy level, but Rand wrote from such a different paradigm of both in terms of the method of philosophy and the questions of philosophy. Right. And getting her paradigm into communication with the one paradigms or context that uh, are common in academic philosophy is is a real challenge it's mm -hmm. it's like you know cross translation mm -hmm. <laughs> of two different languages i think that's a great insight so would you say that rand is a philosopher in the sense that she's engaging with some of the biggest ideas in the world talking about you know the fundamentals of human cognition and our relationship with the world but the way that she phrases those questions and the way that she tries to tackle those questions isn't in the modern academic jargon. It's not in that standard language, and so many people conclude, well, therefore, she's not even a philosopher because she doesn't, she doesn't speak our lingo. Yes, uh, that's essentially right. I mean, philosophy, and this is true of other disciplines as well, uh, tends to function by an ongoing conversation. That was Richard Rorty's um, term a while back. I, my, may or may not have been original with him, but that, you know, there are articles published, ideas put forward to address questions, and then if you're going to write on those issues, you have to be conversant with that literature mm. and try to make some some advance in it, and but speak within a fr an existing framework of mm -hmm. what are the theories on the table, um, and it's very, it becomes highly technical. Academics do that. That's sort of in the nature of the game. <laughs> right. Uh, but in on any rational, normal standard of what philosophy is that would incorporate Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, um, Rand is certainly a philosopher and right. is certainly dealing with this issues at the same level of fundamentality. Uh, I think that's a great summarization. And I've experienced just a little bit of this, not nearly to the level that uh, Rand gets. But in my own pursuits, and my own limited writing on philosophy, I've gotten the same criticism that, oh, well, you're not talking the way that the modern professional philosophers talk in the 20th and 21st century. Therefore, it can't be that you're doing philosophy, which I think is um, uh, fundamentally mistaken. But it's a perfect segue into the actual ideas that Rand was talking about. So Rand was the founder of the School of Objectivism. And the, the two general areas that I want to cover with you today are metaphysics and epistemology. These two kind of blend back and forth into one another. They are foundational to any, um, any philosophy. And so a natural first question is to ask, what are the contents of objectivist metaphysics? What types of things are there? I'm guessing there's physical stuff. Most philosophies say there's some physical stuff. Is there, in addition to physical stuff, is there mental stuff? Are there abstract objects? What's kind of the basic overview of objectivist metaphysics? Okay, we need to separate a couple of dimensions here. One aspect de dealing with the issue of abstract objects is uh, the view, uh, and this would be axiomatic. I mean, it's really a consequence of the law of excluded middle that, you know, the thing is, either has some property or not. It is something specific. So everything that exists is concrete and specific. There are no abstractions out there. Mm. The objectivist view is that abstractions are uh, the result of mental cognitive operations by human beings, and if any other species can do it, you know, by, by a mind, let's put it that way. Okay. Um, so that's 
that's along the scale of concreteness um, versus abstraction. And it's the kind of core question in the problem of universals and its epistemological aspect, the problem of concepts, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, I expect we're going to want to get into a bit. But mm -hmm. in terms of um, ontology, there are certainly physical objects, but the concept of of physical objects is a little tricky because what we see, what we are aware of, and what objectivists would insist on, there's a natural world. Mm. It's things, everything that exists, exists in space, in time, in in some way. There's no supernatural um, in any, you know, religious or mystical sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we distinct, when we form the concept of physical or matter, mm -hmm. material aspects uh, and things. We're doing that by contrast with our introspective awareness of our consciousness, conscious functions and mm. um, feelings, thoughts, desires. And so there are, and which are certainly real as well. So um, the natural world includes conscious beings, which includes not human beings and then and quite a few other species who have the ability to perceive and presumably feel the various degrees of desire and, mm -hmm. and emotional reactions. So there are minds. The technical question, what is the relationship between consciousness and the body or the mind and body, consciousness mm -hmm. and the brain, um, is, is one that is, um, has so many scientific aspects to it that I, I would say as an objectivist, and I think most objectivist philosophers would, would take this view. There is what we know is that consciousness exists. That's, you know, like Descartes, we, we, we regard that as an, uh, you cannot deny that without contradiction. Mm -hmm. But, and so it exists, and we know that it is causally efficacious, uh, which is a, has been a pretty hot topic of discussion in the philosophy of mind for last 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. How, do, um, do mental states have causal efficacy on our physical movements and bodies, or is it just an epiphenomenon with all physical results, including the motion of our limbs and, um, you know, traveling to New York or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, really the product of neural activity only. So on that score, objectivists clearly, we, we certainly believe, and I would argue vehemently that yes, we do. Our, we make choices, we make, um, uh, and as a result of those choice, which we do on the basis of considerations, thoughts, feelings, goals. And when we do, when we make decisions and um, act on them, we, our minds are causal agents in mm -hmm. um, the, the physical realm. Personally, I think from the my, my study and a little bit of um, now mostly outdated uh, knowledge, knowledge of the of uh, you know the brain sciences, is that I I'm comfortable with the idea of mind as an emergent property of certain kinds of complex animate systems. Okay. So I and in fact I think that is a much more fruitful approach instead of a stark contrast everything is either physical um, or mental that is things are organized at different levels and in different at different levels of complexity um, you get um, every you know from molecules to cells to animals to um, functioning organisms to humans and self-direction okay uh, as increasing layers of complexity uh, emerging Okay, so in that kind of broad, big picture look at things, you'd say there are there are physical. Let's just take the simple example of a physical object. There, there's a table right in front of me. Here's a table. Right. The objectivist says yes. There's a table out there in the world that is something that you're perceiving. Um, is it the case that there's such a thing as a mental representation of the table? Is it the case that when I'm looking at what I'm looking at, I'm actually indeed looking at a table in the world? Or is it that I'm looking at a kind of mental impression, which I'm guessing is correlates to some table out there in the world? Well, the, the latter view um, is, uh, would be a representationalist theory of perception. Mm -hmm. And uh, by contrast with realism, which, said, which is that you see the table. 
And um, so I'm a realist. I, that was the thesis of my my first book in epistemology, the evidence of the senses. And again, it would be um, common currency among objectivists. We we see the world. Yes, we see it in a certain way. We see it in virtue of the way it appears. But that it's not justified to infer from that that all we see is the appearance. Hmm. So how do you how do you deal with questions of illusion? So if I you know, let's say I'm in the middle of a very um, vivid dream and I have this seems like I have the same perceptual experience of this table, like maybe I'm dreaming right now of this conversation. How does how would an objectivist deal with direct perception that doesn't appear to correlate to a state of the physical world? Well, precisely because we think perception is the awareness of objects through uh, activation of our sense organs. Hmm. We would not say that in dreaming you are perceiving in the first place. Oh. There is something perception-like in what your mind is doing uh, when you dream. And I don't have a good theory. Uh, I'm not sure that, that this is a philosophical issue in the first place as opposed to a psychological and neurological one. Hmm. Um, but hallucinations, dreaming, the so-called non-veridical experiences, mm -hmm. um, where, where if you define veridical as meaning aware of objects uh, external to your mind, um, those have to be uh, separated from what are called illusions or perceptual illusions, like mm -hmm. the bent stick in water. Mm -hmm. And those are not; um, those are every bit as much the perceptual awareness of the object as it is in itself. It's just that you are perceiving it in conditions that are unusual and therefore if you don't understand that they are unusual you are liable to make the wrong conceptual judgment and say the stick is bent but when you perceive that stick in a glass of water it is appearing to your senses exactly the way it has to in accordance with the way your eyes function and the laws of optics hmm. so there's nothing false about it we don't perceive I introduced the term uh, in my book. There's, a, there's an assumption that we perceive that to be valid, perception has to be diaphanous. Our senses, our uh, faculties of experience cannot have anything to do with the way things look. Mm -hmm. But the way things look is precisely <laughs> a, a relational term about an object with its properties and the detection mechanisms that have evolved for us and other animals are, are, are sensory apparatus. Of course, it. what would be the right way for a, a stick that's in water to appear? <laughs> the non-illusory one. I mean, it would violate the laws of optics. We, that would be a, a really distorting view of the world <laughs> um, if somehow your eyes, if, if it didn't look bent. Hmm. Now, I say that I have to qualify your eyes do and brain your up your visual system and other sensory systems do a lot of correcting um, and thank God because uh, otherwise we you know we have a lot of trouble making our way around in the world you know you, when you move around your table the actual shape on your retina the actual visual um, so-called visual image or retinal image it's going to change because of, again, because of the laws of optics. You don't even notice that because mm. you have, we have the phenomenon of perceptual constancy. Our, our senses, you have to fo adopt a special focus like the way a painter does in order even to notice that the apparent shape is changing even as you are quite, you know, perfectly well aware that the real shape is not changing. Hmm. Okay, so, so let me ask you one more question about that. And then I'll, we'll go to kind of the next step in, in metaphysics. Sure. That when you talk about the stick in the water, it makes me think, and the, and the way you talked about it, how perception through sense organs or, or via sense organs, make it, to me it sounds like a, a type of representationalism. Um, and it, when we're talking about dreaming, I want to I go back to... Uh, let's say that if we use the language of the objectivists, that there's no perception per se going on when you're dreaming. And we say, okay, I'll grant you that word. But there's still mental goings on. There's still a kind of 
show. There's images that I'm, uh, there's an awareness, even if it's not awareness of objects outside of, outside of myself or outside of my eyes. So what is the language then that objectivists would use to describe something like a vivid dream? Well, it's a, ph a phenomenon of consciousness for sure. And it, it does have sensory aspects. And I think we would go as far as saying that um, the contents of dreams, although they you are not actually perceiving anything uh, at the time of your dream and in the dream, the images and shapes and actions are ones that you did at one time see. I mean, it, consciousness has to get its contents from reality initially. Then we can run with them. We can engage in flights of imagination and, and fantasy um, during our waking time and also our brains. Apparently dreams play some incredibly important function uh, <laughs> psychologically because, you know, there's a lot of experiments of depriving people of dreaming and they go nuts. So um, I don't know what that function is exactly, but uh, it may be an internal self self maintenance function that consciousness has, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, your malware bytes uh, software running in the background in your computer just <laughs> or <laughs> or backing you up overnight or whatever, you know, right. uh, to use a computer analogy. So I don't know. Um, but it, it the fact that it's it conscious, I don't see it as a problem. Um, you know, we my my whole approach and, and really Rand's approach was let's look at what um, consciousness is and not make assumptions about a priori assumptions about how it has to function to be valid or a priori assumptions um, that it has to be in some way we have to explain how it reduces to physical neural activity. Hmm. No, let's look at it and understand it and um, draw our conclusions, draw our generalizations that are in accordance with what we understand as, in, as what we can identify as the nature of, of our faculties. They have a nature that's a fundamental principle, um, but what that nature is is something we have to discover. Okay, okay. So let's move on then to the next step here. We'll stick with the table um, example. How in the objectivist metaphysics do you deal with what's called the sorties paradox? So. Um, let's say we're starting with a bunch of wood and our, our goal is to construct a table out of the mm -hmm. wood. Um, it, it may, the, that wood starts maybe eventually as, you know, uh, uh, within a seed and then it slowly grows out of a plant, turns into a tree, a tree gets chopped down and so on. At some point it goes from just wood to a table. There's some, seems like there's some continuum there. And I have lots of different philosophers have their own approach at resolving when, you know, the, the wood turns into the table. Um, what is the Randian solution to Sorty's paradox? Or maybe actually, let's not talk about the table because that's maybe a little bit more complex. An even easier one is um, grains of sand turning into a heap. One grain of sand is not a heap, and yet there are heaps at some point. So where it's at some level adding a grain pops a heap into existence or taking away a grain pops a heap out of existence. How do you deal with that? Um, well, that's an issue that, that yes, that is what uh, most people have in mind when um, they're talking about this uh, so-called sororities paradox. Uh, sororities, if for listeners who are not aware of it, is a, a term in logic for an inference that has multiple steps with each, you know, each step having a conclusion that then becomes a premise for a further step and then to a further conclusion and then that as a premise and so on. So the typical example would be I add, you know, I have one grain of sand on the beach. Um, I add a second one. Um, is that a heap? Well, no. But if that's if adding one doesn't make something a heap, then that should be true no matter how many grains of sand I add. And you mm -hmm. end up with a chain of inferences that says when I get to the um, 347,000th grain, um, that's not a heap because the one, previous one wasn't didn't make a heap, and so <laughs> the next one's not going to make a heap either. But meanwhile, we look at it and we say, "Hey, this is a this is a five foot hill of sand." <laughs> right. So the problem here is that uh, it, it's addressed by Rand's theory of concepts, the objectivist theory, which is that we form concepts on the basis of 
um, patterns of similarity that we notice among things and uh, similarities that allow us to do, isolate one group of, of things and differentiate, differentiate them from others. Um, but the things within the similar groups have, uh, have differences. And what allows this, this cognitive function, um, concept formation, to work as well as it does is that there are, there are high degrees of similarity and then discontinuities to the next most similar thing. But there are always borderline cases. Typical, I mean, a common example, textbook example, is where does yellow stop and red begin? Mm. Um, and you introduce orange. Okay, where does yellow stop and orange begin? Okay, mm -hmm. well, yellow, orange. Okay. However, finally, you split up the visual spectrum, you're going to have borderline cases. Well, okay, so what? Um, if, you, if <laughs> the whole function of concepts is allow you, is to allow you to talk about yellow things uh, as a group for whatever reason to identify things as yellow, like a taxi cab or a, um, a, uh, a sunset. Um, but reality doesn't exist to comply with our concepts. Our concepts exist to allow us to identify reality, and that there are uh, borderline cases is just a fact of the matter. Hmm. And um, so, you know, and, and it's one of my colleagues pointed out one time, when you, when you look at, at sand on the beach, um, and distinguish this, this is a heap, but this isn't, you're not, you, no one does it by count, actually counting grains of sand, right? <laughs> we perceive it if, it, if it has the shape of, of a heap, um, as opposed to the shape of a minor variation in the surface of the sand, that's all we need. We, and there will be borderline cases, so it's a small heap, or an even smaller heap, <laughs> whatever. We can handle it perfectly well by b trying to, you know, trying to give a more definite, precise, specific um, description if we need it, and we can get as precise as we want, even down to gra counting the grains of sand. Okay. But um, this, I, I think, this is uh, this whole question uh, of this of the Sorites paradox in this sense, with continua is uh, a case of what Rand would have called st stamping your feet at reality and saying it, it doesn't make it easy or it doesn't give us the, pres the exact sharp borderlines between concepts. Mm. Oh, boo-hoo. Well, <laughs> come on, let's, let's deal with it. That's the way it is. Okay, so I believe there's a, there's a philosophy called epistemicism, I think it's called, from Timothy Williamson. Um, and his position is, I, I want to know if it's similar to what you're saying. The position is that there is some cutoff in reality, where a heap is some independent thing separate from the, the parts which constitute it. But that boundary might not be able to be identified clearly in our conceptual scheme. So we may never know where the cutoff point is from where you go from just a grain to a heap, but it actually is out there in the world. Or are you saying that actually in the world, the boundaries are fuzzy and it's not just in our conceptual scheme? Well, in this case, I mean, the world is what it is, but it does not include natural kinds in the Aristotelian sense or the realist uh, the realist sense, using realism here for a theory of universals, that there are, actually are kinds that share an inner abstract essence uh, with borderlines uh, so that they either have that essence or they don't, which means it's either a heap or it's not a heap in reality, apart from any human cognition. You know, as I said uh, at the outset, we, we don't think there are any uh, ab abstract aspects in reality itself. Mm. So the, the sand has... Uh, the, the surface of a, a body of sand has the shape it has in, in reality. It is what it is. Identifying it as a heap is a human conceptual means hmm. of making a differentiation between some kinds of surfaces and, and flatter surfaces. So I guess I, I'm not well versed in Williamson's um, theory on this score. So I, I'm just I'm guessing that there is an element of, of Aristotelian realism here. Mm -hmm. um, and if so, then we would we would disagree with it. Okay, so maybe would you? So this is kind of the way that I like to think about this problem in metaphysics, and I wonder if what your position is. I like to say that 
in reality, there are just the base units. There are the there are, there are the grains of sand, if you will, and at whatever point you like, you can call them a heap. Um, but that distinction is conceptual. And if we wanted to be really precise, we could say, okay, one grain of sand is one grain of sand. Two grains is uh, a heap with two grains. Three grains is a heap with three grains. Four <laughs> grains is a... So technically speaking, yes, every heap is a little bit different, and it has an exact precise amount of grains to it, but it's just a lot easier to say, you know, heaps over this certain amount, however we come within our conceptual scheme, we're just going to all call them heaps. Right. You know, when you look at the world and the questions of, of uh, types of things and our identif identification of those types by concepts, you know, w one, of the, one of the principles governing that or epistemological canons would be don't multiply concepts beyond necessity. Mm. Concepts serve a purpose of, of identifying the major significant similarities and drawing major significant differences. And so if the concept of a heap is useful, it's probably useful in distinguishing, you know, a bunch of sand that's mounted into a conical shape of some kind versus a flat surface or a few rip with a few ripples in it. Mm -hmm. So having um, read stipulating a definition of heap that would be, you know, two, a heap of two grains, a heap of three grains, you could the, the word heap there doesn't help you much. It just there, there are two grains. Here we have a bunch of three grains. Here we have a bunch of four grains. Uh, and if there were some cognitive purpose, it w if it was of any use, mm -hmm. if there were enough common attributes of two grain heaps as opposed <laughs> to three grain heaps, that that concept was useful. And you, you, if there were enough, that if if you, you know, if if separating two grain from three grain heaps allowed you to study all the universal common properties of two grain heaps as a type, as opposed to the common properties of three grain heaps. Well, there aren't any real differences, are there, that we know of. <laughs> right. So that's a useless distinction, and um, it's a case of multiplying concepts beyond necessity. That's Rand's mm. razor, um, you know, modeled after Occam's razor. Mm. Don't multiply entities beyond necessity. Mm. I think in this circumstance, the, the reason would be just to resolve any potential paradoxes. So if, if a philosopher to come around and, and say, oh, look, um, reality is indiscrete. There are no clear boundaries in the world because of paradoxes, uh, like continuum paradoxes. We could say, okay, well, in, if we were going to be overly pedantic and come up with concepts that may correlate precisely to the world but don't actually solve anything other than philosophic problems, then I think we could come up with this conceptual scheme. But I agree. In general, there's not much practical use value to coming up with each individual concept um, if it's not necessary. Now, there was, uh, we began this discussion, uh, a, a part of the discussion with uh, your example of the table. And there is a real issue here, which I would say is not so much a matter of a continuum, uh, although there is a continual process if you follow from an acorn to a tree to um, a table. But there, what are the criteria for continued existence of an entity? When has an entity changed hmm. so much? that it is no longer the thing it was, but has been transformed into something else as mm -hmm. a particular. In most cases, you know, if, across a broad range of phenomena, the answers are, are usually pretty clear. For a, a plant, like a tree, plants are built to grow from seeds. So from the seed to the tree, it's, it's continued, it, it, it is growing and maturing as the individual plant that it is. But when it's cut down, sent through the sawmill, and um, planks probably from different trees are put together into a table, but whatever, even the same tree, um, it's no longer a living thing. So uh, pretty clearly it has gone. The living thing has gone out of existence. Mm. And a new thing, an artifact, the table, has come into existence. Mm. Um, now, there are many hard cases like this. And this issue gets very involved, very tied in with the issue of personal identity. What what makes mm. you the same person you are across time? That's an incredibly sticky one. I, I do want to ask just a question right on that because this is one of the things that when I've I've spoken with objectivists, just informally we talk about, and it seems like I might have some disagreement here when we're talking specifically about the table. If I were to scratch the table, 
and and take away some of the parts, some of the the particles that were there. Mm-hmm. Is is it the same exact table or is it a different table? I would no, I'd say it's it's the same table, but the table has changed, or you have changed it, because it what's essential to a table? I mean, it, a table is an artifact, so unlike a natural object like a plant or you know a tree its conditions of identity would have more to do with the human purpose uh, for constructing it, mm-hmm. or at least as much to do with that as with physical shape, size, color, etc. Mm-hmm. And if you scratch the table, um, unless it's a $10,000 antique, uh, which now is now useless <laughs> and is no longer an antique um, or a saleable or one, um, but no, in a normal case, it's the same table. You can still lead off it, work on it or whatever. It's the same, though it's changed? Yes. I mean, the, this paradox of change goes back to, goes back to the, the Greeks and, um, you know, Parmenides, who who's said, um, if a thing is what it is, then it cannot ever be anything but that. So change is impossible. <laughs> and that was, I mean, one of the great things about Aristotle was he said, no, it, obviously, we look at the world, things change. So let's, something about your assumptions has to be wrong. And what... It, uh, Aristotle pointed out that change is a real part of reality, and what that means is that things have the potential to change in certain ways, to affect, um, to act, or to be acted upon in certain ways. Um, and that potential is in their nature as the kind of thing they are, or as the very thing they are. Uh, so as long as they they are they act or are affected in respect of that potential we just say the thing has um, has changed its you know the smoothness if you scratch it the smoothness of its surface has changed mm. but the thing table is still the same table i mean it, it'd be the same thing if, if you move the table two feet to the right mm. it's moved is the same table well change is about things engaged in action which is change so it mm. If any change is makes it a different thing, then you have erased the whole idea of things acting and things changing. Now, it sounds like one way that a thing could maintain its identity while changing in some way is when you said, well, what is a table? It's wrapped up with purpose. It's wrapped up with a kind of human purpose. And in that respect, if that's true, if, if part of what makes a table a table is our intention or our, our, our purposeful action towards it, then it would make sense that you could have superfluous um, things change. You could have a scratch. It could be in a different location in space. You could blow on it and blow some molecules off the top, but the purpose hasn't changed so that that's what it would still maintain its identity. And perhaps, I wonder what you think about this, perhaps if it's the case that all we're identifying, um, all, all that we mean a table is, is only the bits of matter which are located at that place in space and that's it, then it would seem like if the tables get scratched, then indeed it would change. Would that would that follow? Um, y- yes, but I, I guess I would put it a little differently. And the ontology that objectivism would subscribe to is really the same as Aristotle's. There are entities. There are properties that entities have. There are actions and reactions that entities go through. And there are relationships among entities, but the foundation is the existence of entities. Hmm. So there can't be any property unless without unless it's a property of something that is some entity. There's no action except the action of something. Um, there's no relationships except relationships among or between entities. So in that way, entities are kind of the fundamental ontological category, hmm. and change of properties, change of location and whatever um, are part of reality. It's just that we we can't use a priori or, you know, just our arbitrary assumptions about what identity ought to be in terms of properties or actions and say, okay, now we're going to revise or, or even, uh, you know, eliminate or reduce our concept of entity. So if what we mean by the entity in the case of the table is something that has a, as a necessary part of it our purpose, that a, a mental purpose, does that mean that without minds there would be no such things as tables? Uh, well, yes, but not because tables are like concepts. The table actually exists out there. Um, so, and 
it, once it, once it, it exists, it's there regardless of who's aware of it. Um, we could all, you know, some scourge could wipe out all human consciousness and the table would would still exist. It is what it is. But there wouldn't be any tables unless people had made them in the first place. So, so is it the purpose of the table upon its making, or is it that it has to continue to be used as a table in order to be a table? I would say it has to continue to be usable. I mean, a table, tables are made to support things uh, at some level above <laughs> the floor or ground. And once a shape that enables that, once an object with a, sh a shape that enables that function then it is what it is regardless. I mean, and then at that point, you can ignore it. You can never, ever put anything on it. You can put it out <laughs> in the rain and just let the boards warp, whatever. But um, it's not a matter of that at every moment or slice of time. It depends on our conceptual identification of it. It's just that it's an artifact. It was man-made and not natural. So we have to ask, how did it come into existence? I mean, that's typically part of a identity. I, I think this is probably the most perfect segue of any of the conversations I've had because the next time I list the questions I want to ask you is about universals. Uh, and this is when you say the, the table has a shape, it has a certain property to it that even if we don't identify it, it still remains a table. Well, I have to ask you about shapes and properties and universals. So are you... so? First of all, a good, a good way to start would be if you could just explain what the problem of universals is in philosophy and maybe traditional approaches um, and then what you see as Rand's offered solution to the problem of universals. Okay, sure. The problem of universals um, uh, was uh, originated really by, I would say, Plato. Um, who, the first one who had a clear conception of it. We have we take take um, the concept of human being, or take the concept of table. Let's stay with tables. Mm. We have the concept of table, but it there are many tables in the world, and so it seems like there's an, an issue here. There's there are many individual tables, but they seem to be all of a kind, all of a type, and how do we explain that? Mm. They seem to have there must be something in them, <laughs> a tableness or tablehood. <laughs> um, now, so that was one route to Plato's theory, which is called extreme realism, which is there is a abstract object in another dimension called table, the table. And all tables in our world are reflections of that somehow gets a little i mean the metaphysics here is a little spooky or mysterious but mm -hmm. um he made a much bigger point about uh, in regard to numbers because we can look at sets of you know doubles trios um sets of four sets of five sets of six um and there are many such sets for any cardinality so where where do we get the number three well you know Mathematical uh, universals have to be in some other realm. And, and there's still quite a few people who, in philosophy and mathematics who believe that. Mm -hmm. So that's extreme realism. Aristotle said, no, the universal is in the thing itself. Each thing has an, in, an essence. And in respect of its essence, it is identical to every other thing with that same essence. Every horse is identical qua horse with every other horse. It's just that it has all other attributes that are unique and particular to it. Mm. Um, and it, its essence is embodied in different matter. You know, mm. one, one horse is flesh, another horse is flesh, but they have the same essence. Uh, that's a more reasonable, you know, this worldly kind of, of, of uh, theory, but I, I don't think it's sustainable because the only reason for believing we, you know, we don't literally see those essences in things. We don't see horses. We just see, mm. you know, this particular horse in the pasture. That's that's what we see. We don't see mm. horseness per se. So we have to <laughs> infer the existence of that ontological element. What's the basis of the inference? The only basis that's ever been offered, as far as I can see, is 
that's what's needed to make our concept of horse objective because our mm. concept is unitary mm. and universal. And, uh, but Rand came along and said, no, you're assuming that the mind has to be some diaphanous reflection of the world. But no, the mind, in, in this case now we're talking about the conceptual faculty, is a cognitive faculty with a specific mode of operation. And that mode of operation is the capacity to abstract from, uh, to abstract into a common mental unit from the similarities and differences within a group of, of similar things. Hmm. And that puts her um, closer to the camp of what are called nominalists in the mm -hmm. history of the theory of universals. But unlike the, no, the nominalists in, in modern philosophy, uh, Berkeley and Hume are the, are the two classic examples. Um, but what makes them nominalist is that they say it, there are no abstract concepts either in the mind. There are only images. There's my image of the horse. It's just that when I hear the word horse and hear a statement about horses, my mind will call up all the similar images. Mm. But there's not even an abstract concept in the mind. So Rand, Rand would sometimes be described as a um, conceptualist. There are mm. concepts mm. Uh, <clears throat> that are genuinely abstract in the sense of they stand for an open-ended set of things that differ, as she said, only in measurement, uh, only in specific degrees along some dimension. So that's where that's a kind of a, a quick cook's mm. tour of the problem of universals. And it's why I said earlier, it, it it's really tied in. Um, it's really the same problem is a problem of concepts. Okay. So, so let me try to rephrase and see if I do an, an accurate job of rephrasing the circumstance and then Rand's resolution. So talking about the, the horses, what is it that all horses have in common? Well, you have the Plato's, um, extreme realist position, which is that there is such a thing as hoarseness that is so real that it exists separate of any actual horse in another realm. That is the, it is the platonic horse out there. And then horses in this world are mere reflections of the horse. Aristotle might have said, well, there is such a thing as hoarseness in the world, but it's in the individual horses. You can't, it, you can't take the hoarseness somehow out of the horse. Rand is saying, well, yes, there is, uh, or maybe I should put it this way, what hoarseness is, is a concept that we apply to a bunch of different particulars. Is that fair? But there's no hoarseness, there's no metaphysical hoarseness that is somehow outside of our concept of it. Is that correct? Um, yes, that's exactly right. With I would rephrase it in one respect slightly. Instead of that concept of abstraction that we apply to things, I would say it's an abstraction that we um, abstract from things. Because mm -hmm. Rand and objectivism, I mean, the whole idea of objectivity that is kind of our core commitment, um, is that there is a basis in reality for concepts. And that basis is... Um, is the actual real similarities and real differences among things? Isn't that isn't that the Aristotelian position that we recognize the hoarseness, let's say, in all the horses, and then we abstract away, and then we have the concept of hoarseness? Well, yes, but Aristotle thinks that you, for that to work or to be valid, you have to have, you know, the horse essence out there in the horses. So then what is Rand saying? What is, she, what, is the, what is the thing that she's abstracting from? Each horse has its own specific properties, its own specific nature. But it's not, height, that's not essence. A certain color and patterning of colors, a certain hardness of hooves, a certain uh, speed of ma a maximum gait, et cetera, mm. et cetera. No two horses are identical in every respect. Mm. But when you look at a... Um, horses um, in a pasture are lined up at the racetrack and y you can see those differences quite clearly but when a dog enters the picture or a human being you say oh well you know the differences between any one horse and the dog is way way more than the difference between any two of these creatures lined up here at the gate mm -hmm. so that means I'm going to separate these group these these animals these particular animals 
and because they're so similar, their similarities brought out by the, the even though they differ among themselves, those differences pale in significance, mm. visual significance, to start with perceptual level, from uh, by comparison with the difference any one of them has with a dog or a human being. So we form, we say we were, we were aware of the differences among the horses. We, they have different measurements. This is Rand's semi-technical term, different measurements along the different dimensions, in this case of color, height, gait, speed. Mm. But we omit those measurements as merely quantitative as opposed to the really qualitative differences in along those same dimensions of shape, height, mm. speed, et cetera. Okay. The, of, the, of, the, of the dog or the, the person. So we form the concept horse by omitting those measurements. Now, this is a, a complex theory, and the more you get into it, um, the more interesting and insightful it, uh, I think it becomes. And I, having written about this, um, uh, I, I know I am skating over lots of... <laughs> philosophical questions that people might have. But that is the essence of the process that mm. um, Rand put forward. And um, what it means is that there is no horseness out there in those beautiful animals lined up at the gate. Mm. No, they each of them is what it is. But they have similarities along dimensions that allow us to achieve cognitive unity by forming a, the concept of horse to stand for them and so that we say, you know, this one's a horse, that one's a horse, the third one's a horse. We're saying exactly the same thing about each and every one of them. We can use the concept of horse to unite all knowledge of all the other properties that they have and that we discover about them. So that's why uh, I think it's not an Aristotelian kind of view, literally. Okay, now I'm, I think I'm getting close to, to grasping this. And it, 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 to my surprise, I think this is actually... This is pretty close to how I'm trying to put things together in my own, own worldview. Um, so, would you say that the error in the Aristotelian conception is that it's treating hoarseness as a kind of property? That, that that's the kind of thing that is in the horses is the hoarseness. And what Rand is saying, well, no, th there are properties there, but hoarseness isn't one of them. It's all these other properties about, like you said, the hardness of the hoof and maybe the color and the size and the, and the shape. And then on top of those fundamental properties that are in the world, we place the label of hoarseness. So it's kind of a package of, of fundamental properties go into this concept of what a horse is. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. Now, I think that's the view. You've got it right. I like that. Um, but I have to ask about those fundamental properties then. So this, this view, it's a, it's a kind of weak, it's, and just in the way that I'm thinking about it, it's, it's kind of a weak Aristotelian position in the sense that m the, the essence isn't there. The essence of hoarseness isn't there. But there is some real properties in the world that, that exists separate of us. So, so maybe you could say the hoarseness doesn't exist separate of us because that's a concept, but what the hoarseness refers to in the world actually would exist because it's the properties that you've described. But for those properties, you're, think, you're saying that those properties are real things in the world that would exist separate of any conceiving of them, that shape is something uh, unlike higher level taxonomic distinctions, shape is something that is kind of base level. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think I see where you're going with this. Uh, ta taxonomy um, would, you, you know, when you go from horse to animal or horse to, you know, mammal to uh, onward up to animal and to, um, so forth, or downward into types and um, different um, breeds of horse, it, those are different levels of abstraction. So that's all conceptual. But the reason for forming concepts, or one of the great advantages of them, is that we can. It allows us to. Um, what well, it makes it possible for what is, for what we observe about one horse, to be extended or generalized inductively to other horses, um, unless we have evidence um, against that. Now, most of the properties that I mentioned uh, as the perceptual bases for forming the concept of horse would never go into a definition of horse because we know enough um, the adult concept, and especially 
even more than a scientific concept is uh, they're living organisms. Um, each one ha is an organism in its own right. It's very specific. It has a specific form and set of act history of activities of respiration, digestion, reproduction, etc. Its stomach works it, in its own individual way, very similar to the stomach of any other horse, but those are, you know, different properties. The the external color and, and height and gait um, turn out to be, you know, n not what we would want to use to define the concept. We do want to get to what is epistemologically essential um, in our definition of horse. And by that, you know, this is one of um, another part of the objectivist theory. Essences are epistemological, not metaphysical, as Aristotle said. What, make, that, what that means is we want our concepts to refer to, refer to those, those aspects of the things in our category, you know, concept, those aspects which underline and explain the greatest number of other attributes and which are mm. really can't be changed without an, an entity becoming something, you know, outside the category. So a horse could change its color, and no, I mean, we, the different, what makes horses horses at the end of the day is not any specific color, not any specific height within a certain range. We're emitting those measurements. Uh, they are, but the fact that they're alive, that they have um, a mammals structure, and beyond that, you know, whatever other taxonomical, wherever they fit in the biological taxonomy, common properties, those are more essential and, and because they explain what horses can do and why they eat what they eat and why they're so fast, et cetera, et cetera. And they have an evolutionary history as well, which is very important for the biological understanding of what makes a horse a member, you know, what we should use in conceptualizing an animal as a horse, like, inter, you know, interbreeding. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say that for Rand, the only real properties are the ones that we can perceive. Every property, every individual concrete specific property of anything that exists is real, um, whether we can perceive it or not. The spin of atoms, the spin of an atom <laughs> is, is a real property of that atom as an individual thing, even though we can't see it. We know of it only through long chains of inference. But it, does that help? Yes, okay. yeah, and, I, and I'm this. This naturally goes um, into Rand's theory of concepts, and it sounds like there's there's kind of a blending of the epistemology and the metaphysics into this theory of concepts. Which I uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think Rand considered one of her greatest, or maybe her greatest contribution to philosophy was her theory of concepts. Right? Um, I believe she did. I do, and that's saying something because you know, I think in ethics and um, also in uh, aesthetics um she had some really important fundamental insights too but this theory of concepts to me and what we label theoretically as the measurement omission theory of concepts is uh mm. is a huge breakthrough huge insight what are the other aspects of rand's theory of concepts do you find compelling so for example she has a theory um about where concepts come from um do you find that Persuasive, can you tell us about that? What other what other parts of the theory you think are so um, important? Um, yes, there are. This might be get us into a whole, you know, a, a pretty long discussion. Um, but given this theory of concepts and the fact that they serve a cognitive purpose, leads Rand to emphasize the well a couple of things. One is concepts remain. They're not frozen by any by a definition that we happen to have at a given time. You know, a lot of analytic philosophers going back, or, you know, contemporary academic philosophers say, all right, the concept is where it is. Let's define its necessary and sufficient conditions. And then those are the only anything that meets those necessary and sufficient conditions is automatically an instance of the concept. And that's all we have to consider. Rand said mm -hmm. a concept in, integrates a group of actual things, a category of things in reality, and therefore has to remain open to everything that we discover about that, those things, things in that category. And so as we advance in our knowledge, we, we move from understanding uh, this category and defining the relevant concept 
in terms of relatively superficial features and properties of the things to deeper, more causally explain, uh, explanatory ones. So that that's a contextual theory that the, the mind is you know, latched on to uh, this group of things in the world, <laughs> um, this open-ended set of things in the world. And now through study, we the concept remains open. It's like a file, she used the file, file cabinet or file folder. Uh, it's an analogy. Everything you learn, you just put in that file folder. So that's one important um, aspect, and I believe that that's really important pedagogically. To um, you know, as a, as a former teacher, well, I still am a teacher, really. Um, you, I've used that to help students take concepts that they kind of, sort of understand, and get them to have a clearer and and fuller understanding of that very concept that is, you know, that they have. I mean, it's, it, Socrates mm -hmm. was doing the same thing much better than I ever did <laughs> back in uh, mm -hmm. ancient Greece. But, mm -hmm. so that's one thing. Another thing is that because concepts are formed through a certain cognitive process and concepts are formed from already acquired concepts through, you know, related but different, somewhat different processes, each concept is tied to reality through a certain chain of, you know, abstract connections that your mind has drawn and observed. So there are certain conceptual fallacies that Rand um, talked about, and some of them I've, I've never encountered anywhere else in, the, in, in epistemology. The one she um, probably best known for is what's called the stolen concept. Um, if you mm -hmm. have a con one, if you use one concept in a way that negates a prior concept that it depends on, that's the fallacy. The classic example mm. is uh, the statement by, uh, I believe it was um, the so French socialist Proudhon in the 19th century, property is theft. <laughs> right. All right. It, if there's no property, there can't be theft. <laughs> uh, right. So, I mean, it, that's, that's a case of, you know, sawing off the very branch you're standing on cognitively. Mm. Uh, and not, not too many people, not too many philosophers, I think, um, have, have really appreciate the, the phenomena that there are conceptual fallacies as well as the more straightforward, familiar propositional fallacies of ad hominem and circular reasoning, et cetera. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I see that all the time. One of the areas that I enjoy studying is logic. Um, in epistemology, and you see that all the time. Um, there's a, I'm sure you're familiar. There's a school of thinking called paraconsistent logic, where people say, well, in some circumstances, you can have something that is true and false at the same time. I would say that's this, that's the what they're doing. They're, it, that's I like that analogy. They're sawing off the branch <laughs> that they're standing on. Yeah, that 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 involves, um, you know, putting aside the the law, you know, the law of non-contradiction. So, right. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, um, we are out of time. This has been a fantastic conversation. I appreciate you being generous. We went a little bit over. Um, I, one, I think we have proved definitively it is definitely the case that objectivism is a philosophy <laughs> uh, that should be taken seriously because we've just scratched the surface and there's so much here um, to talk about. Well, I agree and I've, I've enjoyed it immensely. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk and uh, I'd be happy to join you again for another conversation if uh, at any time you choose. I'd love to have you back on. I feel like this is one of those areas that um, it just doesn't get as much investigation as it should. So I want, though I disagree with Rand on some things, I definitely want to give her her due. So thanks again. Thank you. Take care. All right, that was my conversation with Dr. David Kelly. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure to check out the show notes page this week, steve-patterson.com slash 61. And if you like this content, if you appreciate that Ayn Rand is being taken seriously and you like this show, you can become a supporting listener at patreon.com slash steve patterson. You can pitch in just a dollar or two whenever new articles or videos or podcasts like this are released. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you again next week.